All right, my friends, we are back with THX right before Cedia 2023. I wanted to get you guys on to talk about some new tech, some new products that you guys are doing, and it talks about cables, my favorite topic. How are you doing, Steven? It's good to see you again. Good to see you and um, all your fellow audioholics out there. Awesome. And now we have a new guest, um, Jack McDougall, and you're from PixelGen. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So I think we should do a little background on both of you guys, and then we'll get into the announcement and we'll we'll talk about what's going on with THX. And then we'll answer some questions if anybody has any. So, Stephen, why don't we start with you since you are officially with THX. We've had you on before, but why don't you give us the 60 second spiel of who you are and what you do at THX? So I'm Steve Martz. I'm the VP of Global Technology Partnerships. Um, my division works on the testing and certification of products. So like you said, we've been on before talking about different um, performance categories. We had probably most recently our THX Dominus uh, certification category for loudspeakers and other electronics in that large room space. So you may know um, us for those types of products, especially here at, at Cedia. You'll see a lot of that in this home theater space here. So uh, today we're here to talk about something else new and, and exciting. So just so everybody knows, I'll be in Denver tomorrow covering Cedia, and I'll be visiting per listen, actually, because they're going to be doing some demos of their Dominus level speakers. And we're going to be doing a video on that. As you guys know, we're huge fans of per listen, and it's a great partnership that you guys at THX have with them. It's really shown. It just shows you how far engineering can go. And when you have standards and, you know, the kind of measurements, mm -hmm. sound quality, dynamics, everything else, we're really big fans of the Dominus level spec. Yeah. So, Jack, why don't we go with you? I never heard of the company Pixel Gem before. Forgive my ignorance, <laughs> but talking to you backstage, it seems like you know your stuff about cables, which is a rare thing in this industry when you're dealing with cable vendors, as you guys know. There's a lot of snake oil out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm the founder and CEO of Pixel Gem, but I guess you could call me that HDMI guy. Uh, some people have called me in, in the past, uh, but we design and manufacture high speed extension products, obviously cables, HDMI 2.1 is the latest spec for HDMI. So we're working with that, uh, display port, USB, uh, we do everything high bandwidth uncompressed, uh, but we also do video processing and we do some other fun things as well. We've done ODM, OEM work in the past, uh, but recently we've done even, uh, pixel gem branded products as well. So very exciting company based out of, uh, Burlington, Ontario, Canada. So it's just west of uh, Toronto, about an hour drive away, depending on the traffic. And uh, yeah, like we're really excited to be here. Uh, this this is uh, getting to this level of THX has been quite the story, uh, and the engineering and, and uh, you know Steve's team and us pushing through to get uh, something out there that kind of challenges all those little bits of snake oil, uh, so that we can you know put some real science behind what's been going on. Because I've been playing the HDMI extension game for well let's see since 2007, so uh, going all the way back to the Blu-ray HD DVD wars, uh, and and you know oh, it, 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 it's yeah it, it's it's been a fun ride, uh, a lot of bumps along along the way as there always are in engineering uh but uh really excited to be here awesome so steven the question i have a fundamental question i have for you or thx in general is why do we need a thx certified hdmi cable what was the uh thought process behind this well you know it, it's, it's a very good question because you you think about thx and you know we're not we're known for our certification of products and um, we are uh, not known for creating things. Uh, historically, you know, back in the cinema space, we had made uh, crossovers at the inception of, of THX uh, for a short while there. But then, you know, we pretty much worked with other manufacturers and other partners um, to certify their products. But um, every once in a while, we'll develop a technology um, or something that sort of has us um, look at the uh, look at the space differently. So. There may be a product that uh, you're, you've talked about in the show called THX Onyx. Um, mm -hmm. That's a DAC amp. And that had grown out of a technology we developed for um, home theater, actually. Um, we created a, um, a line array system um, that had very uh, a very tight spacing, um, a control resolution up to 16 kilohertz um, that we displayed at a CES um, in uh, about 15 years ago. And But to do that, we developed a special technology uh, for the... Uh, amplification. So we actually wanted to use uh, batteries to power this so we can have a quick, very quick load of the capacitors to then to power the system. So that technology became something that we found was very efficient and, and very high performance. And we turned that into 
a, um, a technology that we then partnered out and had other people build products. But we wanted to make a, a, a product for ourselves, um, sort of demonstrate how good this can be. And we created a product called THX, THX Onyx. Uh, and that product um, was very well received, very um, um, uh, a lot of awards and, and, and um, accolades for its performance. So, you know, it's kind of our first um, product in, in this in this uh, CE space. And like, well, that worked really, really well. And, you know, and looking at, you know, other parts of this, uh, of this ecosystem, we're looking at, you know, sort of, that we found this sort of gap in, in the market where, you know, uh, you know, some people say the, 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 the most often forgotten and least appreciated um, part of the process is the interconnect. And we see in this space that a lot of people are, are not quite sure, you know, what to buy or, you know, what, you know, what do I, you know, how, there's a lot of, you know, sort of, um, you know, uh, lack of consumer confidence in the products they buy sometimes, and maybe the performance isn't what they were promised. And we thought, you know what, hey, this might be a great opportunity for THX to come in here and sort of um, streamline this entire process, put out to, put out um, um, some product that people can trust um, at, at is the, the highest performance uh, and um, at a very affordable price. So it's, it's really just a one-stop shop. And don't forget, it completes the ecosystem, right? You know, we talked about THX Dominus THX certified Dominus and the other categories, you know, we're about making things very simple and easy to work with. So, you know, you have a THX ultra autonomous system, all the components just work together. And THX interconnect is exactly that, that one more piece that makes this all work seamlessly together. So it seemed well, like the right thing for us to do um, to make this um, uh, more easy for consumers and, and professionals alike. Well, I can tell you this, we actually reviewed the THX Onyx uh, DAC very favorably. Um, mm -hmm. I know my guy, my writer Wade Ropes, and just really gushed over that product, especially for its value. So that's refreshing to see. And when you guys announced these HDMI cables, and I looked at the prices, and I was very happy about that because you can go with this industry with cables, you can go from a couple of dollars a foot to literally a thousand dollars a foot. No mm -hmm. joke, as you guys mm -hmm. know, we've spoken about this, and often those high-end exotic cables either measure poorly or they don't even measure as good as the cheaper cables. It's just all about the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to ask Jack, since you have all the background in testing and developing HDMI is let's talk about uh, what makes a good HDMI cable. And before you even do that, let's be clear about one thing. I'd like to get this on record. Do you agree that an HDMI cable will either work or it doesn't work. In other words, if your signal is passing, there's no errors, there's no snow, there's no pixelation, you're not gonna get better performance with magical cables. You're either gonna pass all that digital information correctly or you're not gonna pass it at all. There's really no in between. Is that a fair thing to say, Jack? Absolutely, ones and zeros, right? Uh, while ones and zeros can kind of collapse in on each other and some diagrams that we'll bring up, I think later today, uh, it is a digital signal. And whether you're using silver or copper or you're using a very thin gauge or a thick gauge, there's all these different things that you have to, to keep in mind to make sure that you're transmitting that video appropriately and that it's certified. Uh, it's not just 19 wires in a floating in a tube. It's not the way it works. Uh, this whole, you know, sub $5 cable uh, world we live in, that that's like kind of the demand. It's, you'd be lucky to get a cable that works really, really well that way. So um, we rely on certifications both through, uh, historically through HDMI and uh, the THX certification program uh, to make sure that you're getting everything faithfully from A to B, uh, at regardless of length. And that really is the key. There's a lot of key pieces within that cable that, you know, we'll start with that sparkle or a dropout, or sometimes a screen that will say HDCP is not authenticated, or, you know, just, you know, dreaded blue screen of death, right? <laughs> that's the one that I hate the most. And that's the one I've seen the most. So I've seen all these errors. And um, really, what it comes down to is making sure that you understand copper really well. We'd like to think at PixelGen, we know copper better than anybody when it comes to the HDMI market. Um, and we know the, uh, the balance of keeping it practical. So rather than just making a very large, uh, uh, you know, 10 meter cable made of copper and it ends up looking like a garden hose, that, you know, it might do the job, it might be compliant, but is that feasible? Is that something that someone can actually use in their home? Likely not. You'd, you'd likely want to keep your ports on your very, you know, expensive toys. So what we've done with the THX interconnect line that I'm very proud of is to make sure that every length we're keeping it as thin as possible. So you get up to two meters, you have a very thin gauge. You get up to three meters, you have to thicken it up a little bit, but you maintain that thinness. Five meters, same same idea. 
But then when you kind of cross over into that optical world, we want to make sure we do that only for that reason. We wouldn't want to put out like a one meter optical cable, let's say, or anything like that. That would be complete overkill. So we really truly understand where copper has its last legs and it kind of enters into the optical world. And a lot of the same uh, um, design implementation is actually throughout the entire system, uh, or, or each length, I should say. Um, for example, the eARC. Uh, eARC is, is done in copper throughout the entire THX, THX interconnect line. So it's a controlled, a highly controlled twisted pair within the cable um, that actually is, is what uh, sets the benchmark for the longest reach for native HDMI over uh, that link. It's not, it's not the high speed at all. It's actually the ER uh, making sure that it works well. You get all your uncompressed audio codecs com coming upstream through the video. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we know those little areas, those key pieces. And we can get into, you know, any little level of the construction, how we built it from the inside out. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, talk about it at any level. So I'm just showing a couple of pictures here of what the THX cables look like. And as you can see here, one thing I like about it is the fact that it's flexible. You yeah. know, it's not it's infinitely rigid. It's not going to, it looks like it's not going to just fall off of the back of your AVR or, or your connecting equipment. And as That's you right. said, it's not like a garden hose, which is refreshing. Yeah. yeah and that's one of the key things. I mean, I, you know, I'm a consumer as well, you know, as we're also working for THX and, you know, I just, you know, every time you have those really long length cables and you're trying to put that in the back of your display and you just can't even bend it enough to get out the, uh, the cover in the back. You know, yeah. Right. And see, yeah, I have, so Jack yeah, and I both hold our cables here. Your hey, look, here. it's, you know, it's now it's a real show, Steve. Look at that. Yes. Yeah. You, you bend that. Uh, explain. You know, there's, there's, you're plugging it into something there. That's right. not part of the cable, right? So, you know, he's bending it. And like the those cables at that length have a one inch bend radius, you know, and that's fantastic. And they have a braided jacket on the outside too. And that's how thin they are. So even if you get to the three meter and five meter cable, you know, you're looking at a, a cable that's, um, you know, uh, very bendable and can you fit inside of any display um, yes. cover without, uh, without worrying about, you know, trying to, you know, have a, a two foot radius coming out the back. And not all, all right. lengths too, Steve, right? That's an important yeah. part is that we're not just saying at this little two meter length that that's mm -hmm. the advantage. We wanted to do that right across the board, right up to 15 meters. So yeah. we want that, that lead to be as short as possible have the same advantage all the way through, no matter what SKU you're using, so yeah. that you're, you're getting that same advantage throughout the family of product. And that there's so, no, oh, sorry, go ahead, Gene. I was gonna ask you, is, is the thickness of the cable the same, whether it's one meter or 15 meter, because you compensate for the copper size and then you switch over to fiber, is the cable pretty uniform in thickness or are they different thicknesses depending on which length you get? Yeah, it's all between five and eight millimeters. So like that's relatively small. The only one that gets to eight millimeters, believe it or not, is the five meter. The five meter uses a 26 gauge core for eight wires. So you add up all those eight wires that run your 48 gig, that will dictate how thick that cable is actually gonna end up being. The outer diameter is about eight millimeters. So it definitely gets to that that uh, threshold where THX and PF pixel gen just say, that's as thick as we could possibly go where you're gonna get back into these same other problems. Yeah, um, yeah. And I've seen 22 gauge cables literally over an inch thick. And it's, yeah. it's, and, and it's, it's just, it's waiting for accidents to happen and, and to be some really upset customers out there. Yeah. yeah. I ran uh, back in 2005, I ran an HDMI cable through conduit to my ceiling and it was literally like that. Yeah. It was 22 gauge Absolutely, and it was yeah. difficult because if you didn't have strain relief on the cable, it would whip right off your equipment. So I'm assuming five meters is, is like you said, is a threshold for copper going to fiber. Is that because of the 48 gigabit throughput yes. requirement for HDMI yep. 2.1. You got it. Yeah. So when you hit five meters, that's where you hit the the threshold of where HDMI ATC, so their testing program, will actually deem it a fail if you go beyond that. So when you get to like the six or seven meter at that particular gauge, the eye diagram that we actually uh, been talking about here and there yeah, and I'll everywhere. Put that on. Yeah. On a second. So the, as I say, the eye doesn't lie. So this is an eye diagram. It's actually to some people, it, it, they may be familiar with it. Some people may have just you know seen it and just glossed over. But it's actually quite a, a simple um, diagram that underscores the the performance of the THX interconnect. So if you can imagine, you know, we don't have a display or a piece of equipment that can give us a snapshot of you know say a million ones and zeros streaming down from left to right. Uh, so in a differential signal, you have a plus and a minus. They're running uh, the same signal and they're attracting to each other down to ground and back up to their rail voltage. And all this is, is if you can imagine taking a piece of paper and 
drawing out all those ones and zeros onto a piece of paper and then kind of folding it like an accordion onto each other, putting it under a really intense light, you're seeing all the ones and all the zeros in, in the stream rising and falling. So the idea is like, it's kind of like the heat map here. In the middle, you have almost like a white. That's where 90% of the hits of, of the ones and zeros are coming from. And on the outer edges where you go in from the purple, blue and the, and the green, those are areas where less less frequently the ones and zeros are going up and down. That could be for a myriad of reasons. It could just be the construction of the cable, uh, the type of, of copper being used or, 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 or whatever, um, the electromechanical details in that. But I, to get a clean eye, if you look closely in the eye of the storm there, sorry, a little too soon for that, we look at right, right in the middle there, you got that little little diamond. And that's called an eye mask. The idea is to stay out of that with significant margin. And as you can see, we can do that. So if you actually have a, a any one of those lines hits through that, that would be considered an eye hit. And if an eye gets hit, that means you're going to see some type of sparkle or a dropout or a confusion of the overall system. Interesting. So what do you what device do you use to measure this? Is it a logic analyzer or is it a specific device to measure um to generate eye diagrams on HDMI cables. Yep. So this is met that that was captured with a high speed oscilloscope that goes right up to 12 and a half gigabit per second. And that waveform was, I believe, 11.88 gigabit per second, which yeah. is what HDMI runs. But the source is what's called a BERT. A BERT is a bit error rate tester. It's essentially mm -hmm. sending blasting bits in what's called a uh, I don't want to go into too much alphabet soup today. I've been told not to. But it's it's called PRBS data. So PRBS data for all connectivity, you know, fanatics like myself. Um, every you know USB cables, DisplayPort cables, HDMI cables, they use different types of PRBS data to kind of stress the system. So HDMI is has always used PRBS seven. It's two to the seven amounts of combinations of of eight bits of data. So it's a basic, it's a huge stream of data that stresses an equalizer as hard as it possibly can. And then I'll wake up your audience again. So basically getting to that point, you're saying uh, that if you have an open diagram with that stressful of a signal, you know that you're getting the best of the best. Uh, in video broadcast, which is actually my background, I, I used to work on video broadcast. Uh, you know, you get a giant truck outside a football stadium and you're going really, really far. They actually use PRBS 31. Uh, where it's such a stressful image, but they do it because they want to control and make it a reliable link. So you may notice as we talk, I have a lot of my video broadcast brain has been kind of bouncing back and forth into this residential and commercial markets since I started PixelGen. So it's it's nice to see the same kind of methodologies with the standardization and, and yeah. broadcast brought into the into the home. Yeah. It's interesting because my background is actually telecom. Before I did audio holics, I was designing analog front ends of modems with uh, the ones that worked over pots. Over there, you go. Know, yeah. Over, yeah, same thing. We ran bit error rate tests. We generated eye diagrams like this. And guys, it's important to note this is the same principles that you that govern digital audio as well. If you're using coax or toss link, I mean, it's 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 all ones and zeros. You're going to get an eye pattern like this, and if it's passing and there's plenty of that black space around that diamond. The cable's transparent. There's no other magic around it. And I just, I, it's great to have you on here as a subject matter expert, basically, you know, reiterating what we've always been saying about cables. Yeah. So, so you can see sorry, why yeah. we are working with uh, Jack and PixelGen uh, for this product right here. Oh, it's yeah. Very, very clear. I mean, we uh, started working together about 10 years ago when THX started certifying HDMI interconnects, you know, we previously, you know, we had, you know, done other types of interconnects before that, but working in that space, you know, he was our launch partner for the long reach cables. And, you know, over this time, you know, just uh, our appreciation to his uh, deep knowledge and dedication um, to the fine art of HDMI um, transmission um, and the technology that uh, his company's developed over these years, especially in these long length cables, you know, the pixel glass. Uh, and then, you know, that, that she just kind of showed the amplifier there, the, um, the pixel drive, uh, it was a clear, you know, um, choice for us in bringing in a partner to help develop these cables and uh, bring them to market. So, you know, all that the knowledge you're seeing right right now is uh, a really strong, uh, the strongest motivator for why we're working together um, to bring these cables to, to the public. So, Jack, I have a question for you. When you get beyond five meters, my understanding is these cables then go to fiber. A lot of fiber cables on the market. I know I use a uh, bullet train, for example, uh, in mm -hmm. my system. Uh, they have a little um, a, a little dongle that powers the cable. I don't see that in your cable. So how are you generating the power to keep the noise floor really low right, when you're right. going these longer lengths? 
Yeah, so we call them five volt injectors. Essentially, yeah. So you can put them at either end, and they just basically tap into the five volt line. Uh, so your audience is clear. The five volt line is just a single pin that comes out of the HDMI source that uh, traditionally has only been used for powering one EDID chip that's in in the display. Really, that's its only use. Um, and there's one other piece, but I won't get into too much detail. But it only ever needed the 55 milliamps. So there was, for about a decade, people are fighting, trying to create all these, uh, these uh, solutions for long reach. And the injector just became like a mainstay. Uh, however, HDMI has done some pretty good things. They, believe it or not, they've come up with a, a piece of the standard called cable power. So it's it's very upfront. It's exactly what it is, which I truly love. They didn't name it something that was hard to identify with, but it gives you 300 milliamps of power. So in, in, the, new, in the new equipment, there shouldn't be any issues, but we've actually designed this to come below that 50 milliamps anyways, while maintaining the, the power that it needs, which is only five milliamps to a needed chip, very low. So we're mm -hmm. actually, you know, within the legal sense of HDMI, we're, we're where we need to be to power these devices. Uh, we used to put those injectors in there as like a fail safe because uh, if there was some wonky player that didn't give enough juice out of that five volt pin, then there could be an answer. But that was really the only reason we did it. Um, now we're, we're completely sold on just an end to end, you know, inclusive link, uh, which is directional. I should, you know, tell our audience uh, it wouldn't, you know, damage anything by going the wrong way. It would never design something like that, but making sure that it, 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 uh, it can have all the juice and be, you know, the optical side can be taken care of with those modules. So what's the direction orientation? Is it from the source to the, to the display or yeah. is it from the display? Okay. Yeah. All right. So if you have, for example, if you have all of your sources plugged into your AV processor, mm -hmm. then you take the the arrow that goes from the AV processor to the HDMI out and points out towards the TV, right? Is mm -hmm. that how you would do it? Yeah, so exactly. The, the power is coming from the AV processor to power the cable, not from the TV. But we've actually taken a new approach, and, and this kind of underlines THX and, and Pixel Gen's ground up design of this. This was never a, you know, we built this great little box, you white label it and let's go. It was never that. It was from the ground up. So what we talked about was we had a conversation about arrows and words like source and display. And we've, I think Steve is starting to tremble remembering that conversation mm -hmm. that we wish we had that hour of our lives back. But <laughs> essentially what we realized was that as long as we label source and display with no arrows, that is all the end user needs to know. Did I yeah. plug it in the right direction? An arrow could actually mean the flow of video. It could mm -hmm. actually mean that, well, that's the direction of your source or that's the direction of your display. So after we, you know, we did 10 rounds, we settled on source display. So that if I'm so it's on, on the screen, silk screen of the connector. Yes, exactly. So it yeah, actually says the word better. source and says the word display, which isn't that all that new to be quite honest with you. A lot of uh, good good uh, solutions in the market do so something similar, but others will combine arrows and wording and things like that. So we kind of fell on this really nice. Okay, where this is where it feels like it should uh, yeah. lie. And, and actually, if I could just back up one really important piece. That uh, eye diagram that you brought up, why it's so important. You don't have to bring it up again. I think people- I'll bring should... it up. Okay. Why this is actually important is that there's a piece of technology in the, in the 2.1 spec called link training. Now link training, how it works is that if you're sending, uh, say you're sending an 8K signal and it's an 8K60 that you want to run. So it's running around 40 gigabit per second. The receiver, if it, for whatever reason, uh, be it the cable or a combination of the cable and the source itself, exceeds the uh the the cleanliness of this this eye diagram essentially where the signal overruns the opening of that eye um it's possible that the training will actually drop to the next available format maybe it's 8k 30. now you may not even realize that's happening so in a way what we're doing with thx interconnect is we're our goal is to be immune to that piece of functionality and that we never actually trigger that event so that's why it's actually really important to have the highest quality because if you're, you know, like I said, a bad source with a, uh, a cable, even if we have the perfect cable, what if at the end of that, there is a bit error, we wouldn't want to actually bring that down. So we've built a lot of margin into the design to make sure that we will never trigger that mechanism. Um, in other technologies, link training you know, for display port, for example, will do something a little different. They'll actually see a bad eye and they'll send a message through an auxiliary channel over copper down upstream to the source. And it'll actually send boost, what's called pre-emphasis or de-emphasis. 
to actually boost that signal so that it actually harmonizes and it works. But this is different. It's not to say it's a bad piece of technology. It's actually a really good way to prevent black screens, but it's something that's not really being broadcast too much. And we want to make sure that we never trigger into that event. Right. I think the biggest problem I often see with, you know, when you have your Apple TV plugged into your display is you often get an HDCP error. Oh, beautiful. You know, yeah. things are just not syncing up right. So, I mean, what are ways to kind of mitigate that? Is it is it the cable yep. or it is the cable? That's it is the cable. And let's go through a few. Uh, I've been through almost 20 years of HDCP errors. So if, it, if there was no HDCP, the world would have been a much better place. But of course, Hollywood content needs to be secured. You can't tap off something and just read it and take down the, the physical media market. It's it's there for a reason. It's really important. So we take it very seriously. We don't play any gimmicks. We don't strip the keys, which I've seen. Things like that. Really, really bad things that could land you in court and some really awful things. What we actually do is we isolate. There's two wires that are responsible for HDCP. They're called DDC lines. It's essentially an I2C standard. In electronics world, that's basically just a clock and data that just times out communication to different devices on a PCB, let's say. The DDC lines over the cable are actually running over this you know, 10 or 15 meters of cable. That communication needs to be perfect. And uh, there's an event called shark finning like, that I've coined, where the square edges kind of turn into shark fins. And they don't actually reach their full potential of uh, power rail. So to avoid that, we actually make sure that we thicken up those two wires, we isolate those wires, and, and not just isolate the single wire with a good shielding, but make sure that that bundle, that DDC line, those two wires are isolated from the high speed so that they can't kind of talk to each other because there could be crosstalk effects. Right. And one other thing I've seen with HDCP that we don't do, and actually it's, it's, a, it's something that I haven't seen anyone really look for, but I've seen it in many cables that I've cut open because that's what I do, is that they actually twist those wires. So if you go long, a long distance and you twist those two wires that are responsible for clock and data and HDCP, They're when longer. we go, when we, yeah. So when we go into a scope, you can actually see clock on top of the data signal. It actually jumps over and actually modulates right on top of the data, which can actually cause bit error rate within the HDCP. And that's where you get that image or my favorite, which is the flashing screen that looks great. So it's like amazing image, but it's just flashing that pseudo random noise image that everybody's seen. So we do quite a bit of work to make sure that that works, not just in the short range, but when you cross over to the optical, same ideas over the, the back the back channel there, making sure we do all those isolation techniques. And we take a lot of pride in that because it would have been a lot easier just to kind of throw two wires down a, down a, a tube. Interesting. Uh, a couple of questions I want to address here and then we could continue on. Someone's asking, are yours... I guess they mean, are your cables certified? So what's the certification process of THX cables? Is it done through pixel gen or is it, hmm. or is it THX that's actually certifying it? So these cables are THX's cables. So they're not THX certified as far as that program. They're our own cables. So putting a certified branding on here would just, you know, kind of be redundant in some way, but these cables meet all of our specifications um, for performance or exceed those in, in many areas. So um, we put our, our branding on there as our own cable. And that's, that's what's um, kind of stands out there to customers. They can anchor on that and rely on that um, okay. as, as a, is that, so it's internal testing. You know, we have it. We have it tested um, uh, according to our specifications for that um, product. Uh, gotcha. But there's there's one thing I also wanted to mention about you know uh, uh, this this product here is you know it's they're HDMI um, certified and we we uh, believe in what HDMI uh, certification means to the industry and strongly support that um, because it's it's really good for consumers to know um, uh, across the industry that they have something they can look at. And, and have verifiable performance in a cable. Um, so that's one part of our, our, our product and our certification uh, programs. But the other is like, we, we look at, you know, really real life use cases, you know, we're sort of looking at the product and how people use it, uh, looking at failure points and trying to make sure that those, those things are addressed as well. Um, you know, we look at like power sequencing, you know, burn and testing, um, and then sort of like interoperability with our devices, you know, trying, trying a bunch of different HK devices, making sure they work 
um, with those products on the source end and and, um, and receiver end. So make sure that all this stuff works really well. We talked about bend testing, you know, uh, bend radius, all these things that kind of go into um, you know uh, everyday every everyday use of the cable and make that easier for people. Whether someone you know at home, uh, a consumer plugging it in or a professional running it through a conduit, you know, making sure that works as well too. So so a lot of things we yeah. look at and in, in just into just making sure a signal gets from point A to point Z um, in a cable. And, and if yeah. I can interject, I mean, it's what attracted us to the, the, even the 4K standard from way back when was that they were attacking the stimulus that actually caused the problems with long reach specifically. It's really easy to make an optical cable and to have it up and kind of walk away and just tiptoe and hope that nothing goes wrong. It's another thing to put it through, like like Steve was mentioning, the hot plugs, the power sequencing, all, all the madness, you know, a brownout in your house. What happens when that active cable comes back on? Do you have to kind of reset it? Those are things that I don't believe THX would ever want to, you know, support, which is why the branding was supported on the certification. Uh, but now it's in the actual line itself. And the, one thing I wanted to add as well is just as an example, that is the little uh, hologram there that from the HDMI standard, the ultra high speeds uh, label that they call it. And it has right. a uh, an accompanying app that you use that does, you know, you scan it. It tells you where it came from, THX interconnect tells you the length, it tells you when it was tested. Um, very important <laughs> to uh, acknowledge a technology. Uh, I, I, I think it's it's absolutely uh, pertinent to make sure that that's always the key. And because you're working alongside this technology standard to make sure it's it's done the best. And THX has kind of took it to that next level of, of compatibility, interop, and all those fun things. Right. Here's another question that I think is a good one. You mentioned fiber optic cables being overkill for short lengths. Is there any truth to fiber being less susceptible to EMI and 60 hertz noise? No, no. So noise comes into effect with long copper cables. So when I say long copper cables, five meters is not long when it comes right. to, to this. Like you couldn't, EMI effects happen when your signal to noise ratio hits a point where it's either even or parity or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you get to a point where it's basically just a dirt signal waiting for that 60 hertz noise to hum, and then bad things can happen. But we don't approach that because we're trying to get something that has that open eye again at five meters. We're not encroaching on that. And believe it or not, I mean, we could have passed HDMI certification by going really, really thick at five meters, and it would have gone around that diamond, and it would have been fine. Um, but we're trying to make sure that it's so much margin that that signal to noise ratio is just David and Goliath. Like we have so much solid signal, but such a low, a low level of noise that, or I should say ground floor, that incoming, you know, alien crosstalk in these things will not actually, you know, work with that. But optical obviously is, is the ultimate because we're talking light, we're not talking electrical. So that's why we're going into that that world is because it's immune to that. It still has some effect because you still have the other ends that do go into the electrical form. But those are at where the signal is really pristine. So you really don't have to worry about EMI as much. Okay. I know we were talking about um, when you have a really short cable, you don't necessarily want to have a lot of copper on that. And I know uh, back in the day when I was using HD base T and I would terminate uh, the ballums. And if I used a really short HDMI cable, it didn't work very well. Right. Can you describe why that's the case and why you have why your shorter cables actually have maybe less copper than some of the longer ones. Yeah. So, so like, once again, I think Steve, we might have to wake him up in about a minute because he's heard this. <laughs> Do it in 60 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will. Um, I, okay. So we actually found, uh, I would say about maybe five to 10 years ago, we were at, in Toronto at a, a dealer site and they had a particular brand of cable and they were saying, well, these are only half a meter. Like what could possibly go wrong here? Uh, they were actually blaming our pixel glass long reach that we're going from an amp to a projector. So obviously everyone's pointing at us because it's the scariest cable in the link. Um, but it ended up being that short cable. And what we found in after, some, after some investigation was that if you just have an HDMI cable with a thick gauge across you know, all your short lengths, you could be susceptible to what I call over-equalization. Without getting into too much detail, essentially what happens is a 0.5 meter cable, if you have a, a thicker wire, which makes sense that you would go thicker for, to be more stable, but it's actually counter to that statement. At 0.5 meters, it could end up, the signal would look too good, if, that, if you can believe it, and would over-equalize the signal because the display or the amp has a chip inside that auto-tunes or auto-equalizes that mm -hmm. signal. 
and it has a minimum and a maximum. So if it has a low uh, dB of, of recovery versus a high amount for a longer cable, if it sees something that's so pristine at its minimum, that minimum could even over equalize that pristine signal. So what we did with THX Interconnect, which I'm really proud of, and it, it seems like a secret sauce right now, but I bet you in six months it'll be the, the norm, is that we purposefully made the cable thinner at the shorter lengths. So at 0.5 meter, the 0.5 meter skew, it uses a 34 gauge over those eight wires responsible for 48 gig. So it actually looks like a 0.8 to, to one meter cable on paper through uh, the lens of uh, an insertion loss measurement. It would actually match side by side. If you ran through a proper S21 insertion loss measurement and you, it, was a, it was a black box testing, the 0.5 meter 34 gauge would look identical to a 0.8 uh, 26 gauge, let's say. So we're, we're, that's why we did that. When you get in between, that's the sweet spot. Equalizers are fine. And of, of course, we, we get into optical when you go beyond that. Now, you said that the, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, these cables are available from a half a meter all the way to 15 meters. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, and, and, nine, and nine different lengths, uh, six of copper and three of the AOC. And actually, one thing to point out is that the, you know, these cables we have here, the, the 15 meter cable is only one millimeter thicker than, I'm sorry, I'm turning into a little man here. Uh, it's only one millimeter thicker um, than this cable right here. So you run 15 meters long and that's pretty much what you get, you know, over the whole length. Right. Um, is there a reason why you stopped at 15 meter? Is it because yep. I'm thinking if, if someone's, if someone's doing pre-construction and they're setting up a video distribution area in a closet, in a media closet, and then want to jump out to the rest of the house. 15 meters is not long enough. It's yeah, it, it, it certainly wasn't a business decision. It was a technical decision. So there is a way to get to 20 meters, but it goes past our rules that we have within of the overall diameter of the cable. To get that to happen, you'd have to go to about a centimeter in, in the overall outer diameter. When you get to that, all those problems we talked about before come back into play, and that's not something I believe with believe in. And I think I've I've uh, impressed that on the THX team as well. But that's not the kind of world I want to live in. So right now, as it stands, 15 meters is the certified maximum. And what breaks it is actually surprising. Everyone thinks it could be that you know 12 gigabit per second or 48 gigabit per second. It's actually the eARC. The eARC to get to that 20 meter length, that plateau, you have to thicken it up to a very thick gauge, which compounds the size of that diameter of that cable and then makes it unusable, not unusable, but it takes it beyond our standards. And so until we can find a way to get that eARC done properly where it's compliant and the video still passes the way it should, you know, that's kind of our cap. But yeah, it, it, there would be a nice, a nice hit sometime next year where we could investigate in ways to get eARC to kind of stop so we can go even further because with optical as you know we could go 50 100 meters mm -hmm. so i'm just going to put this up so people understand the pricing uh this is this is from our article we posted an article about a week and a half two weeks ago when you guys dropped this information to me and i wanted to go over the pricing structure here so this is very reasonable so we're looking at about 40 dollars is this for the half meter and then 400 dollars right. for the 15 meter is that that's that's the range yeah yeah they go up uh, gradually in, in the lower range for the, the shorter length cables. Uh, and then once you start hitting the, uh, certainly the, the long length cables, um, the price goes up based on the technology, because of the technology. Um, but uh, the, the, our strategy is to make these super affordable. I mean, you can go out there, look in the market uh, for, you know, competitive cables and find your, you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, significantly more money at another zero, you know, for some of these. And, uh, right. you know, we wanted to make this super accessible to everybody. You know, you, you can't uh, buy a better cable at a better price. Excellent. Um, I'm going to put up a link here for anybody because uh, I'm wondering where you can get these right now because I haven't seen a place to order and I just got my answer here. Yeah. Taking pre-orders at THX.com slash THX dash interconnect. I'll put a link. I think I might have already put a link in the uh, YouTube description. If not, I'll add it after our live stream. So right now, the way to buy these cables, taking pre-orders is directly through THX. But are you looking at maybe branching out and having distributors or, or online retailers? What's what's the roadmap for this? Yeah, we're looking to make this accessible to as many people as possible. So right now, until we get the um, uh, the production um, up and running and, and being able to send these uh, out to customers, but we're looking at other channels to make them direct to consumer as well. Excellent. Now, someone's asking if there's uh, Canadian distribution. I mean, is it, can you order it from Canada? <laughs> is that a trick question? 
<laughs> I'm a fellow Canadian. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, right, right now, actually, if you click on that THX link, if you go through the the first uh, the intro there, it does have that link to the PixelGen site. So we're actually set up as a customer facing uh, portal for for the THX interconnect right now, and we're slowly but surely uh, setting up the trade site for dealers and resellers and even distribution. I mean, PixelGen's been doing this for some time now, and it's it was a beautiful marriage. We had we had the uh, the site and the um, the factory, and we have everything that we need to pull it out of uh, Canada. So actually the answer to that is that we're direct out of Canada uh, right right now, assuming we had physical product, because right now we have our we have our lovely samples, but uh, no one can get their hands on those quite yet. But when they're available, they'll be available in late fall and they'll be uh, direct out of, uh, out of Canada. Great. Uh, these approved to go behind drywall. If you want to, if you want to yep. run these behind drywall, there's there's no problems with that. Nope, CL2 rated, so you know that that's uh, perfectly good for that. Um, you know, there's a bit of an overkill there for the shorter range, but they can still they're still CL2 rated as well. Obviously, you're not going through with a two meter cable. Uh, you might <laughs> uh, run it somewhere underneath, but uh, it's it's important. So, excellent. Um, do you guys have any other points you want to talk about HDMI? Because I was going to ask you about the uh, certification training that you guys are starting to do. Again, unfortunately, we weren't able to announce this before Cedia, so it's probably too late for anyone to take advantage at Cedia. But before we get into that, Steve, uh, did you guys have any other points you want to talk about regarding HDMI or the HDMI THX products? Yeah, I think it just reiterate, you know, the fact that you know we're our focus here is to streamline you know what the consumers needs are in cables and uh tjx interconnect is just you know our effort to sort of make that purchasing process easy to, to have a trustworthy brand that you know you're gonna get the highest level of quality at, at the most affordable price and um, just look for you know uh, that thx label and that thx cable so let me ask you this now, Jack, off topic question for you. If a consumer at home wants to test the cable before they plug it into their system, how confident do you feel about some of the AVRs that have that self-test? I know Den and Marantz right. has that. I believe some of the other manufacturers have that. Is that a good litmus test before you go and install the cable into your system? It's good. It's It, it would be the kind of the entry point. And I mean, it's better than nothing. Uh, so I would definitely say that we would have obviously high confidence with the THX interconnect because we validate everything through, uh, I'm sure you've seen it, the Meridio pairs, like the Fox and Hound. Yep. Um, so we've used those uh, uh, 6G versions uh, for, for several, several years, um, but now they have their new 8K version, which is amazing. Um, and it does like a thorough, you know, frame comparative test over minutes uh, and does uh, a lot of really good things with the actual cable test. So that would be kind of like the, the perfect installer based test. But if you don't have that and you're falling short of that, then definitely uh, the AMP test can at least give you something. But if we don't work with that, then we're not in the right business, to be honest. Yeah, with you. no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I've, I've actually found a lot of dud cables just using that little uh, self test. Yeah. All right. So, Steve, last but not least. Why don't you talk a little bit about the THX certified installer trainings? Uh, now, this is going on at Cedia probably right now as we speak, but is this also available offline um, when people are not at Cedia? Is there a way to do this virtually? And no, this what is, is it actually, all about? This is um, actually live today, this morning. Um, so we did, it's the day before the show. So it was a, the educational and training day um, leading up to the show. So we had a four hour session. That was not the uh, actual training, you know, theater level one, two, or three. It was more of the um, the launch and the kickoff, you know, sort of sort of introduction, the reintroduction to us back into training. Um, during COVID, we stopped uh, all, you know, uh, uh, in person trainings, and uh, you know, wanted to restart that back up. And we partner with um, Jerry LeMay at Home Acoustics Alliance uh, to uh, do our training. So Jerry and I were there this morning. Uh, talking about THX, kind of you know who who we uh, where, where we've come from and and what we're doing now and what we want to do in the future, and talked about topics in in home, in home audio um, that are near and dear to most people's hearts. Uh, so it was a really really great session that we had um, to sort of uh, reintroduce um, what we want to sort of um, communicate in home theater um, ideology and, uh, and philosophy um, uh, with when for people making home theaters, especially for all the installers here at, at CDA. So we Man, that, um, that name goes way back, Jerry Lemay. I got I was HAA cert, level one certified like twenty four years ago. That's how long <laughs> he's been doing this. So he, yeah. he's a good guy. He knows his stuff. Yeah, and if anyone knows him, you're right. You know, one hundred percent a great guy. I 
I really, uh, you know, appreciate his style and his delivery and, and the way he interacts um, with students on topics and things. And, um, you know, so we, we kind of both, you know, kind of tag team today um, on, on the session. And, um, you know, there's, there's no you know, better partner for us to um, work with in this capacity as well. So um, we'll, we'll um, put some trainings up on uh, um, THX.com very shortly, uh, but we're probably looking at CES uh, 2024 is our first official um, launch of Home THX Home Theater One, but we'll have Home Theater One uh, and Two and Three um, uh, levels here. So for, for the more advanced uh, um, classes that are that are very workshop focused, so really in depth um, uh, immersion into designing home theaters at the highest levels um, for you know RP22 uh, style three and four rooms. If um, if you really are working at that level, so. Um, it's, it's a great place for, for knowledge and a great place for um, uh, sort of uh, just talking to other people in the industry and, and sort of figuring what best ways to solve that home theater puzzle. Excellent. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up what we were talking about with these cables. You guys are going to have to send me some samples that I can test when they're Absolutely. available for sure. Um, I'm sure. So, you know, one thing I have last question for you, Jack, is what's the hardest consumer signal right now to pass because my understanding is we don't really have any native uh throughput uh consumer signals beyond right now 18 gigabits maybe 40 is the max if you have like a playstation the newer playstation oh, yeah or... yeah so like with uh with the standard ce equipment right now that are you know constantly churning levels of firmware upgrades um you know the some of the the streaming devices out there that promise getting to 8k they're kind of just kind of waiting to get there for a myriad of reasons content availability obviously is up there um but i mean right now i mean if you're looking at you know working with playstations and things like that and xboxes i mean these are these are the ones that are pumping out some a lot of power um mm -hmm. and it's not just 8k you're looking at 4k 120 uh getting up there from like 32 to 40 gigabit per second that's some high speed that's really churning over a cable uh, which is obviously proving to the industry of why a properly compliant cable is is important. Uh, so I mean that that's that's why we have labels all over everything. As we hope people believe that we're doing this for a reason. It certainly, is not cheap to do it. It's not like we just slap a sticker down and call it a day. We, we have to believe in it, and we have to have that seal of approval. So um, yeah, I mean the the bandwidths are going to go up, and the world of optical is going to migrate into that copper world eventually. Um, it will get down to that one or two meters. It'll be, it'll just become the mainstay, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And I, you know, future HDMI iterations that will expand into higher resolutions and higher HDMI format or HDR formats, excuse me. Uh, that's where things get really, really exciting. Um, but you know, we'll see it's, it's, it's been a fun ride getting from 4k to 8k. We'll see what the next thing is. Awesome. Well, Jack, Steve, appreciate you guys coming on here on our live stream, dropping the knowledge on the new THX HDMI cables. Guys, if you like this video, please hit the thumb up. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. We're going to be doing a lot of coverage at Cedia uh, in the next couple of days. We're going to probably pump out you know, between 17 and 20 videos if my health holds up and I don't get COVID or anything like that. Okay. So we will be covering some of that. We'll also be having some more information on, on Per Listen. We're going to be doing more on their um, in-ceiling speakers as well as their limited edition S7T demo. So lots of cool stuff coming down the pipe. Steven, I'm sorry I didn't I wasn't able to connect with you at Denver. I don't think our schedules are going to coincide to meet in person, but it's always great to have you here next on, time. on our channel. Yeah, thanks for, for sure having. next time. And well, one, guys, last, that, one, one last shameless plug, Gene. If you want to see sure. this Barco residential booth, you know, instead of just seeing it across the uh, the internet waves, you can see it on a Barco residential booth. They'll have it live connected there. You're going to see some cool stuff. So that 3901, 3901. kind of back in the corner. So uh, happy to see anyone who wants to check it out. Definitely. I will stop by. That's a wrap, guys. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. Thank you, Gene.